Um, if I can do a quick <laughs> introduction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, tonight's uh, talk is by Dave Dunley. He's a Saturn Coldfield-based photographer. Uh, he explores um, a lot of film photography, a 35 mil mostly, isn't it, Dave? And medium format, yeah. Medium format. And uh, tonight uh, Dave will talk us through his infrared journey as per title of the of the webinar um his photography as i see it is um touching a lot on uh documentary uh, but also the fine art uh, so it's it's a nice transition between those two and uh, dave is a former uh, chairman of the frame creatives uh, an organization here in, in west midlands a non-profit organization for photographers Uh, unfortunately, we had to um, um, <laughs> um, well, the organization doesn't exist anymore, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, well, Dave, if you could uh, say a few words about yes. yourself as well okay. as yeah. if I do um, what I'll do is um, part of my presentation, um, if I uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, and if I do view, play, slideshow, part of my, um, let me drop this down. Oops, I can't, that's it. Uh, just, just bear with me a second. That's okay. I, I could, so I can drop down, I could not see myself, which isn't a good, good look. Right, <laughs> there we go. So, I'll start. Um, I'll explain my, the objectives of my presentation this evening and also an agenda on what I'll cover. And also, I'd like to thank Aggie and the DPS for the uh, opportunity to present this uh, um, this afternoon. Um, I've just recently had a full hip replacement on the right-hand side, and so I had to self-isolate and I've obviously not been bombing about, so I've had some time to put this presentation together specifically for the DPS. Um, so the objective is not to assume that everybody knows a lot about infrared photography to explain it, um, basically the ways you can capture it. Um, a bit like dogs for Christmas, infrared is not just for landscape, you can use it on other subjects. Um, the best, best conditions really for shooting infrared photography and um, a little bit of my journey uh, uh, using infrared. So I'll give you a little bit of personal background, which um, I guess touched on. The equipment I've been using for infrared, I'll show you my images, and hopefully if um, you're not all fallen asleep, you can ask me some questions at the end. So uh, as Aggie mentioned, having a few grey hairs, I started in the, uh, the film days, predominantly black and white, um, then moved to compact digital cameras, Uh, went, then moved to digital SLRs, um, carried on with compact cameras. And in 2013, bought my first Olympus mirrorless camera and then a better model in 2017. Uh, as Aggie says, I shoot quite a bit of film, including Polaroids, and I've, I've done various things, including I run workshops for a local club on how to use the on one editing software. So I think that's enough about me. So, um, start off with a selfie, not a normal infrared image. So, this is just across from where I live at Sutton Park. And, and this is an infrared image. And so, um, I thought I'd just throw that in there because that's something a little bit different. So, uh, my style of photography has been described as conventional with a twist, which I think is pretty good. Uh, I do tend to shoot 90, 95% black and white, high contrast, and occasionally low-key images, and uh, hence the attraction to infrared, because most of them converted to, to black and white. So what is infrared like? Well, as you can see on the diagram there, it's just at the end of the visible spectrum where it's red going into the infrared and then it goes radio wave. So that's why when you take a, an infrared image, 
it tends to be pink or reddish before you then convert it and either swap the color channels or um, convert it to, to black and white. Um, the problem is, in, because you can't see it, um, the way you can use infrared on a traditional film or digital camera that's not been converted, you have to use a filter. And I started with a coking filter and they are inc incredibly dark. I mean, you can hold it up to the sun and barely see light through it. So you put it into a, a, a filter holder. You have to use a tripod because the exposures could be 30 minutes, sorry, 30 seconds to two minutes. But what you find is you'll get light leaks from where the viewfinder is and the gap between the filter and the front of your lens with the coking filter holder. So I found I had to wrap some black cloth around the, the filter holder and drop something over the um, eye cup. But that's the, the easiest and the cheapest way to buy a, uh, a filter and add it to your, your lens. Then I had uh, my Micro Four Thirds uh, Olympus E620 DSLR converted to um, infrared. And the standard conversion tends to be around 720 nanometers. Don't worry too much about what that means. I'll show you a diagram later. When you get a camera converted, you can choose a filter within a certain frequency range. And that then determines how black and white or how much color is left in the image um, when you take it. Uh, and the people that convert it then tend to give you a custom white balance. So what you see in your live view, or if you're fortunate to have a mirrorless camera in your electronic viewfinder, you see the black and white image, which helps a lot. And now you can shoot um, handheld and use it like a normal camera. Uh, my latest one I had converted um, a couple of years ago, fantastic company in the UK. Uh, I think it was about 200, 250 pounds. And they do the conversion, they readjust the focusing because infrared focus is slightly different to visible light and set up a custom white balance for you. And the reason I had that one converted is I can now use all my main um, lenses, including macro. So I can basically go out with the normal camera and the infrared body and use that as well. As I mentioned, for those that have got film, have shot film, you may remember on some of the lenses, the little red marks rather than the white marks showing you where the focusing would be for if you were shooting infrared film. So as I say, filters, the cheapest way to start. I wouldn't go for the coking. I would actually go for a screwing filter that goes on the front so you're less likely to get light leaks and then choose the, the filter for your biggest lens at the front of the lens. And you can use these things called step-down rings so you can then adapt it to all of your, your lenses. But uh, again, a tripod is a must. I mentioned IR conversion approximately 250 uh, pounds plus donor body. Ideally that donor body is the same um, make as your main lenses. Um, but don't get worried about um, megapixels. Um, decide what filter wavelength you want. If you go to that website where I had my last camera converted, they've got fantastic information on the conversions and the different type of filter effects, and I will I'll show you a, a screenshot from that later. Um, as also, there are a few websites, certain lenses render inf uh, infrared better than uh, others. I'm not quite sure why, but you can find out, or you know, obviously you do it by um, trial and error. And surprisingly, it's not always your most expensive pro lenses that give the best images. Quite often, a kit lens will give you very good images. Um, if you haven't got mirrorless, use live view. Obviously, if you've got mirrorless, you can see in the viewfinder or on the back what the image is going to look like. And because the way infrared works, you normally have to increase your exposure by one to two stops. So, you know, always check your histogram and make sure you've got uh, the histogram going towards the right without clipping. So 
Well, these are the kind of standard um, conversions. My last one I had was the 665. Um, a lot of people who just want black and white go for the 720. And then you can see the, the others. So here's a little um, example of what they look like. So at the top, starting with 590 down to the clear glass. So as you can see, the standard image at the top, auto white balance, the customized white balance. And then when you've swapped the channels, that's the type of colors you can get. So basically you, you decide the type of um, look you want from your infrared um, image. I tend to want black and white. So I tend to look at 665 and 720. So you're probably aware that um, infrared, I think it's absorbed by leaves because of the chlorophyll or something. So foliage and grass tends to appear white, which uh, is, can give you a really nice effect. Uh, and trees, obviously, the, the leaves appear white, except for the, sometimes the bark doesn't appear as white. And um, conifer trees don't uh, appear white because I think the way they process the light is different. Uh, blue skies tend to go dark. Clouds um, tend to stand out a lot more. There's a lot more detail and kind of contrast. If you shoot skin tones, um, the skin becomes almost like white marble or alabaster. But, but do be careful because it then tends to, if there's um, any veins they or blemishes, they, they can show. But otherwise, it makes skin look very nice and smooth. The other downside is that depending if you catch the eye exactly right, the eyes may appear black. So you can get some uh, interesting um, looks with black eyes. Traditionally, when you want to shoot infrared is at midday when there's strong sunlight, which of course is not normally the shooting time. You know, we usually as photographers want the, the golden hour in the end of the day or the blue hour in the morning. So. This is a great opportunity if you're, I don't know, on holiday and it's very strong uh, sunlight um, midday, then that's a great time to go shoot infrared uh, and also quite often strong shadows, which also quite often complement uh, an infrared image. So you know, clear skies aren't always good. You ideally have some clouds. The thing I've found is it shoot at any time because, you know, experiment, just because people shoot, associate landscapes with infrared doesn't mean you've just got to shoot um, landscapes. Um, I do think it helps if you think in black and white when you're going out shooting infrared because traditionally that's the bulk of the, the conversions. Um, I've shot in the studio with it and you will get uh, an, a decent effect with um, strobes. Studio strobes flash don't, doesn't seem to be quite as good, but studio strobe lights have had some uh, quite pleasing results. And, you know, still life and macro work. Um, I don't know if you watch the British Photography Challenge programme, but there was this article on you know, shooting uh, nature, which Chris Packham was on, and he was actually shooting infrared macro which then galvanized me to go in the garden and get my macro lens out and shoot some infrared as well and the other thing is uh, quite often if you really want to get into it and see what it looks like just take your infrared camera it's been quite a few times i've gone out with my standard camera and my infrared and i've not taken my standard camera out so you just take your infrared camera you're forced to use it and I think your learning curve is, is far quicker. So uh, I think somebody asked about channels, channel swapping, how you edit your infrared images. You've got quite a few choices available. The traditional black and white, your channel and mixer options, depending on your software package. Experiment uh, with the Olympus, like a Fuji and a few other cameras, have some really nice in-camera filter effects. Well, try those as well. If you've, you've had a camera that's been converted that has in-camera filters, it's quite interesting 
having a filter within a filter, so to speak. The other thing, as I mentioned about the focusing, initially when you import your your images, which you know, traditionally are raw, and as we all know, um, in the back of your camera, they, they tend to show the JPEG, so they've sharpened it, and, and uh, the camera has automatically done that. You probably will need to add a bit of sharpening to your image, unless you want a particularly nice, soft, kind of almost ethereal, dreamy look. And I'm not a big one for swapping skies and doing composite composite and that I, I don't spend too much time editing or uh, trying to emulate infrared in software i've got a camera so i go out and shoot infrared so uh, this is not far from my house but my favorite tree walking into sutton park and so that's basically straight out of the back of the camera taking the shot when i look at it in the camera because of the custom white balance for viewing in the, the viewfinder on the back of the screen, I would see black and white, but the image that's captured um, is the pure raw, so that's what you, you would see. Then if you go into your channel mixer options on your software package, you can actually swap you know, the red for the blue, and so you can start getting some quite interesting effects. Or you can do part, channel swap and just you know just paint in the areas you want to be uh, in blue or do the traditional uh, conversion and convert it to black and white and what i would say is whatever your standard process is for converting your images to black and white stay with that to start off with and then i think you'll find you'll start tweaking it maybe increasing the contrast and things like that So I'll start off with the, some, some of my images. Um, not, not all, well, a lot of these images are just really for reference. They're not kind of competition images. They're just my personal images. Uh, but I'm trying to give you a good range of um, subjects. So if you haven't shot infrared, it might stimulate you. Or if you've shot traditionally landscapes, you might look at um, some of the subjects. And um, this is the first image I took um, on my first converted infrared camera, a mere 12 megapixels, but this will easily blow up to A3 with no problem at all. And uh, this is uh, a little walk I did in a certain park. And I think this really shows up the traditional infrared effect, whereby the blue sky is on black, the clouds have got a lot more depth to them, the grass is white and the foliage, depending on where it is in, in uh, blooming, uh, is white or in the background, you can see there in the, on the left, there's um, some pine trees in the distance. So I think this is a, a good as a example of showing you the spectrum of effects that um, infrared uh, images tend to have. Uh, again, walking in Sutton Park, again, a Typical, I like uh, doing shadow hunting. Doing it with black and white and infrared, again, is another good way of, of getting it and getting a slightly different uh, finish. You probably think this is a really kind of frosty morning in Sutton Park, and of course, it, it's obviously a very bright day. And uh, another from my walk in Sutton Park. And as you can see, the footpath where <clears throat> the grass has been trodden down tends to be a little bit darker. So one of the challenges is if you've got a lot of foliage and it's all the similar type plant, etc., cetera, your, your image may be tonally not have a great range. So it's, it's always worth, say, checking, and then you'll start to get an eye for what will work better than other images for, for infrared. And another one in, in certain park, again, as you can see, the footpath, the way it's, it goes through to the earth is slightly darker. And you then start getting very nice effects in the sky. I mean, it, it was nice um, in blue and white and all, but I do think the, the sky going dark where it's normally bright blue does add some depth to it. 
and uh, up in the, the North Coast 500, up in Scotland on a misty day, a hazy day. Um, again, not tonally uh, a great range of, of, of uh, greys, but I thought it suited a high key image. And you can see where the, the tar road doesn't absorb the infrared, now it kind of stands out. So I've just put that in really to show you a more um, high key uh, image and um, kind of, uh, shots from Scotland. And again, just another example of, of the, the road winding into the distance. And um, here's a church. So again, this is a good example when you start to see kind of brickwork and things that don't absorb infrared. They then tend to stand out quite a lot, uh, as does the path. Now, <clears throat> probably I've made this a bit too contrasty for a lot of people. So what you would do is play with the contrast if you wanted to lighten the, um, the tomb, uh, the headstones and the, uh, the brickwork of the church. Same again here, I've just lightened this one very slightly, excuse me. Um, here's um, an example up at Chatsworth with some um, modern sculptures in the, the grounds. Again, as you can see, the tonal ranges between the different um, tree foliage and then reflections are quite interesting in the, um, in the water as well. And uh, that's what a mackerel sky looks like in um, in infrared. So it's as I say, it's quite interesting when you go out and, and do cloudscapes. Just what happens when you um, you shoot in infrared? And another one from a Sutton Park with one of the dogs we recently lost, unfortunately. And you can see um, some sky trails there, and also some. Uh, a little bit of lens flare on the top right, so you can see the aperture blades, which, to be honest, I, I, I quite like. But um, again, just showing the uh, how interesting the sky can be. And uh, yet another from uh, Sutton Park, but this is a, a panorama of stitched together using the On One software. I did this one um, handheld. Um, and again, it's really just, it's just to show the, the sky. Uh, my favourite tree again, playing around with a uh, kind of a cheap fisheye lens I've got, and it was uh, very interested in the, the lens flare on the left, which again is uh, quite different, so I've left that in. And I'm going back to what I would say is a more traditional uh, infrared image shot. I think this is a bit of Grange. So it's that's this is where you have the challenge where there's a lot of the flowers, you'll, you'll just have lots of whites and it's sometimes hard to separate the individual bushes or plants. So it's good if you can get a little bit of brickwork, stonework or some other structure in just to uh, break, it, the, break it up uh, tonally. And uh, there's another one of um, Chatsworth looking down on the uh, on the house, and um, you can see the the sky almost merging into the um, the land in the distance. Quite like the statue looking down on the house. Again, I think this might be uh, Biddulf Grange, and again, I'm just showing you that, uh, you know, if you think in black and white, then, you know, this is, I'd probably take this shot in black and white, but it's interesting how the infrared has just put a different spin on it with the some of the foliage being nice and white, and again, the clouds standing out that little bit more. And uh, you can always try sunsets as well, so here's a one out at uh, in up at uh, North Norfolk with the uh, the sun setting uh, again. My uh, high contrast preference. Uh, some people probably have it a lot um, 
lighter, but that's that's just my style. This is the new Mercedes CLA, and it's a bit like Hannibal, the cannibal from Silence of the Lambs. Oh, I don't know how this... Um, we've got some background noise there. Anyway, uh, this is a hard draw of force um, up in the Yorkshire on a very, very flat lighting day. And as you can see, flat lighting doesn't really suit <laughs> normal uh, photography or infrared. There's not enough light hitting the rocks to give you the shadows and, and detail. Um, so, but I, th I thought I'd throw that in as an example that you know, normally you like, uh, it, it prefers fairly strong lighting. And there are the uh, cliffs of Hunstanton um, shot later in the afternoon. Uh, again, just showing that you know you can you can do different types of images with um, infrared, um, and it's just interesting how it brought out the the strata in the in the cliffs. And is, is it, I think as I've got a couple of shots now where in my Olympus camera, there's a, a, an option where it makes things very kind of dark and moody and contrasty. Um, and having had that camera converted to infrared, I thought I'd, I'd try it with the filter. And it's just quite interesting what it's done to the, to the sky. So can make things slightly more kind of spooky sometimes. Um, and also when you look up, because the canopy is a lot of leaves, it might appear quite dark to you when you look up. But when you point the camera up, because they're white, you suddenly see a lot more than you can see with the, the naked eye. So it really is quite interesting if you're walking through some woods or forest, do look up and point your camera and have a look at what you see because it could be quite quite different to what you see with the with the naked arm so i'll just focus on some leaves quite close and just as it all disappears up into the um the canopy and with the clouds uh, in the distance and then again a, a similar type thing but this time with one of the um in-camera filters and this is me kind of uh, kind of going more, more over to my arty side and looking for something that's, you know what it is, but you're not quite sure what it is and how you've got it. So, um, yeah, so I, I find it quite an interesting image. Maybe not one you want to uh, gaze at too long before you go to bed. And this is a more kind of traditional black and white where I've left a slight kind of red sepia tone in it. Uh, this is the Angel of the North, which if you've seen it, is it kind of got a, a rust type finish, the type of chroma steel they use is kind of red. So I just thought that a slight hue would suit it. And um, if you can look closely, you can see um, some people there. So it gives you a good idea of the scale. And of course, uh, the shadows are reasonable leading line up to it as well. And uh, again, a cloudy sky always helps. Yeah, so we were fortunate when we were out at Norfolk, uh, the place called Lexham Hall only opens um, once or twice a year. So um, this is one of the occasions I took both cameras and only the infrared camera came out. And again, I think this is a good example of seeing what kind of more classical infrared images look like and some of the challenges you have going around National Trust and gardens when there's a lot of foliage and it may all kind of blend into one. But if you've got some stone structure again, it helps um, break it up. So again, here you can see a range of foliage, uh, the clouds in the distance, um, and it's really just trying to find enough differential in the tone to make it an interesting image. The car is renowned for its aerodynamic shape, which not only helps... Uh, there's another one as well. You can see in the distance, there's a kind of more conifer and fir tree uh, styles that are, are that much darker. And then when you do your conversion, you can decide just how light or dark you want the, the image to be. Now, this is an interesting image in as much this kind of arbour. Uh, when I looked up, 
here, so you can see Rather it's covered in, in leaves, and it was kind of virtually black together. to the naked eye. The but when I pointed the camera up, it was like it was translucent. So again, it was really interesting that I just happened to look up and thought, oh, it looks a bit dark. Let's have a look in the camera. And uh, obviously it was, as you can see, they're a lot lighter and showing a lot of the detail of the, uh, all the veins and uh, little twigs and branches. That's just an, another uh, shot of it. This is one of my favourite traditional um, infrared images. Uh, luckily, it didn't get a swan with a reflection, some reflections in the water. We've got the uh, skies in the distance and a range of uh, foliage um, kind of kind of wrapping around it all. So uh, this is what I would call a, a more traditional um, infrared image. But it's, it's quite interesting when you walk around, you start to get your eye in and see things and you start to visualise what it's going to look before you take the photo. Big fan of that. And the little finishing touches and materials just all look... And another one from, um, from Lex and Vaughan, the traditional little bridge running over. doesn't fill out the screen, which I think makes a little bit naff. And you don't get the ambient lighting as well as a few other extras, so I definitely think it's worth it. Plus... And the classic little shot of a, a little table and a couple of chairs and the, uh, the door uh, surrounded by some um, growth. Uh, but again, because it's in infrared, rather than that being dark and green, it looks like it's had a hard frost or something. So again, it just it's a slightly different spin on uh, what would be a traditional uh, capturing of a, a little corner in a, in a nice garden. I have one little bug there. And that's when you're listening on Spotify um, or Apple Cityscapes Apple. are a really good opportunity for infrared um, because the skies and obviously the architecture. Um, what I've got here is a, a few examples where, like this one, I've got an old 35mm uh, Carl Zenner uh, 5 image, so it's a a five image pentagon in the middle with five facets coming off it and so that's quite interesting putting it on a on a lens and then looking through and then having the infrared so this is kind of a an old 35 mil filter bolted onto a mirrorless camera that's been converted to infrared so now, the, you know, the, the effects are only limited by your imagination. And then you just the wander around and see, you know, some images work better than others. There's a lot in here that I wouldn't normally show, but I've put in, in really just to show you examples of how architecture can work. And some of the uh, gritty bits of uh, Birmingham kind of uh, emphasised. The standard shooting brake engine range consists of three mm. petrol options. You're almost it's making it look like a like scene from Blade Runner. The entry level 1.3 litre petrol has 134 brake horsepower and is badged the CLA. And then you can get some quite, you know, I think we'll recognise where that is in Birmingham. You kind of move around and, uh, you know, you can actually spin the filter on the end. So just try and get something that's a little more pleasing and just get some different effects. I mean, I think that would look really nice in just without the filter on but i just the filters to me just added a, a different uh, element by having multiple shots of the, um, the clock tower as you can see at the bottom the i was near a tram as well so it's interesting what elements tend to come through because the center of the filter tends to be a little stronger, the more dominant image, obviously, and the other facets show just some aspects of it. And I think you probably recognize that. That's just um, outside the uh, Birmingham Museum with all the new buildings in the background. Uh, but again, I just like the effect of the filter plus the infrared kind of making it kind of stand out a little bit and make it more abstract. Again here, just, just some of the construction that was going on and really just, just playing uh, with that infrared and the filter. Uh, 
the Marmite building. You might either love it or hate it, but maybe a slightly different take on it. Shot of the crane. And again, just, just experimenting. I think that's the thing with infrared is, you know, start experimenting and start to feel for your style and then maybe start putting another twist on it. I wasn't going to put this one in, uh, but if you look at the kind of top quarter, you can see the, the cross from the dome is just floating by itself, as is one of the flags. And I just thought that was <clears throat> that was something um, quite interesting, given the um, the cross pointing up to the skies and I don't know if there's anything hidden in that or not. And um, just going around the, uh, the custard factory. And again, uh, another one from uh, the centre. I don't think she's amused, but uh, anyway, I quite liked it. And another uh, hunting ground, if you want, is it's normally good for black and white anyway, is if you go to cemeteries. This is, uh, I think, at Warstone Cemetery <coughs> in the Jewellery Quarter. So again, headstones, um, some grass you know, in the clouds, and some of the... Uh, more interesting uh, kind of headstones. Um, so something different. Uh, trying something that's not a traditional infrared images. As I said, experiment. Because you're shooting a new, I don't know what they want to call it, a genre or, or something different, uh, you know, don't feel you have to stick to the traditional landscape images, experiment. Um, process them differently. Try the channel swapping, if you like, playing around with the colours. Or if you're going to do your black and white, do you want a very, very uh, soft high key or do you want a very low key image? And so there's an example of something different. That's the water fountain, a new one um, uh, in Birmingham. With the, with the filter. It almost looked like jellyfish. And um, a couple on a bench out at Hunstanton. So um, a bit of street photography with um, infrared. Again, uh, it would look quite different with the grass being a lot darker and um, and the, the effect on the sky. So again, you know, just, just experiment with... Um, uh, with, with your photography. And uh, this was shot in um, certain woods. And this is basically what was on the back of the camera with the white balance. Um, the model had had a hair coloured and it, it wasn't blue. So it was quite interesting on how it came out. But if you look at the eyes, they're quite dark and the skin's very smooth. I've not had to use any skin retouching or was it frequency separation or whatever they call it in Adobe? Uh, but then you know you then decide on the processing you want. And I ended up with with that image. So it's just kind of showing you really what you can get. Again, another one um, using studio lighting. If you look at the model's eyes, they are quite dark. So I think you have to be quite selective so then this is the reason i put that in to show you you know you you have to be aware of what the infrared effect will have on on the skin and eyes um, here's a an environmental portrait um of josh um but again if you look at his eyes they are quite dark now obviously you could go in and lighten those quite a lot with uh, some uh, dodging and burning but again, it's really a, just a good example of showing you um, the effects of infrared. And, you know, whilst he could have had quite a craggy face, it's obviously taken its smooth quite a lot of that out. So this is um, some studio work shot um, using my infrared camera and then processed on this occasion for a slightly more high key 
not have to do anything to the skin tones. But here's low key. So this was, was shot in a studio with two black polyboards behind the model in a V and then a studio light set really high at 45 degrees with a snoot with a little grid on it. So the light basically was just hitting the model's uh, head and face. And I was looking for a kind of Hollywood kind of almost classic noir look. And it's quite interesting with the infrared because of what it's done to the skin. And uh, I really like this effect, but I don't think you'd, when you think of um, infrared photography, this is may not be the image you think of. But I just thought, of, well, I'll exper experiment and try it. And that's another one shot with the same lighting setup. It's a really light, you know, it's just one light and you know, not much processing afterwards. And again, maybe a slightly more high key, key version of it. But if you look on the back of the hands, can you now see the veins standing out more? Obviously, I could remove those, but again, it's just to show you, you know, you may have some challenges. Uh, I mean, it might look quite good with a, a male model and if you want a kind of a, a grittier look. But um, anyway, that's just to show you the, the effects. Um, and again, you know, you don't have to convert it so it looks like everything's frosty. That's just a little shot of some beads of water. Um, and a shaft of light coming through um, the woods. Process in a more traditional black and white manner. And that's, um, as you'd expect, is um, a more traditional seeing the foliage as white. What are we doing for time? I've not done this talk before, so I don't think we're doing too bad. And again, you know, shaft of light um, on an overcast day hitting some trees and, and thinking about showing it in, <laughs> literally in a different light and just having, rather than making it very white with all the ground, just highlighting the, the areas that are light and just making it stand out to um, give that type of an effect. Um, there's one, um, an image of um, an old wooden shed and some ivy around it. And some um, kind of macro work now. So using my macro lens and getting up kind of quite close um, and just shooting um at a very shallow depth of field to kind of throw the background down so I can, it can go to black and just a little hint of the, the other flower in the background. So again, it's not something you would traditionally associate with a, an infrared image. Uh, and here's a very high key version of, of a stamen coming out of the, uh, out of a, uh, a flower. You know, really zoomed in quite a lot with my macro lens and um, it's just something different uh, this is oh, I forget the name of it now um, oh it's gone but again it's quite interesting the, um, the effect and uh, you know I really like that as a more um, arty type shot, more kind of fine art, because you know what it is, but you don't quite know what it is and why you've um, why you've got that effect. So um, I can see a few chat things coming up, but I can't see them on my screen. So what I'll do is when I finish my presentation, I'll try and answer any questions that have come up in, in the interim. And that's a shot of a clematis seed head. I took in the garden earlier this week. <clears throat> so it was standing out by itself, with lots of space between it and the background. So 
I zoomed in using a 300 millimeter telephoto lenses. As you may be aware, telephotos at their extreme end and, and then at their minimum focusing distance can be, you know, kind of getting onto a semi macro effect. And um, I just saw that and thought immediately, that's separated from the background. That'll look really nice um, in the infrared and black and white. So that's helped me isolate it. So yeah, it, um, I'm not sure what people might think it is, whether it's something under the water. But again, it's um, kind of the type of thing I like to do with macro work with infrared. And here's another, well, it's one of my, my favourites that I've done recently. Again, really close up, macro work, high key, and um, just seeing uh, a, the, kind of the middle of a flower in, in, in a different way. I think I was asked to try and keep it down to about an hour. So uh, here's my, my tips for infrared photography. If you can get a dedicated body, you don't need lots of pixels. In fact, I know quite a few photographers have, have got four and six megapixel cameras and they're producing fantastic images. <clears throat> Excuse me, obviously with the show coming up and all the cameras you get at the DPS, I'm sure you can pick up some bargains and uh, get one converted. <laughs> um, If you can, like when you're shooting black and white, if you can pre-visualise the image as you get used to it, that really helps. As I said, try and think black and white because that will help even with the channel swapping. And as I say, just experiment. And, you know, most important thing is kind of have fun with your photography. And, yeah, enjoy your creative process. Thank you. So I'll, shall I stop sharing my screen now? Um, if I can do that. Uh, there we go. Stop sharing. And uh, right, let's uh, I see any questions here. Yes. Right, here we go. Um, yes, it is. Artichoke, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, well, with me, my, my gardening expertise is if it's green side up and laying turf, and that's about it. Um, what is the filter you use, the multi subject effect? Uh, thanks. Well, I'm going to pay somebody here. Thanks for a varied uh, lecture. That, that's a old 35 millimeter film filter that slips over the end of a, a lens. In this case, it happens to be 58 millimeter. They're incredibly rare. I haven't found another one, but you can get the same effect by buying a coking filter. And if you search eBay in that, there's still um, the multi-image filters you can get for a few pounds. So basically, yes, just get one of those. Right, can I explain the channel swap in detail? I'll have a quick go, because I've not done a lot of it. So basically what you do, you import your raw file. And as you can see, it, it was kind of uh, red initially. And again, it depends on the filter if you choose. If you go back to the, if I can, the slide where it shows you the different nanometer filters, some of them keep more color. If you want to do a lot of channel swapping, then get that conversion. And so I don't use Adobe, but in on one, you can go and choose options, and one of them is the channel mixer. If you then go into channel mixer, you can then say you can change the reds to, to blue, the blues to red, and you just play with the sliders. So um, there are quite a lot of um, YouTube videos showing you how to play with the channel mixers for infrared. Uh, that's not my speciality. Well, are there any other messages? I'm, I'm more than happy if people want to, um, if you want to unmute people to ask um, any uh, questions. Or, or are they, are you all hungry for your tea? <laughs> uh, Olivia is thanking you, Dave. Um, she will get her um, old um, infrared filter again. Yeah. 
And I'm sure, Olivia, it will be a success. <laughs> and, and as I say, you know, at the moment we're getting some bright sunlight and, uh, you know, it's it's great. And I say, if you've got to use it, if it's a, a screw-on filter, even with a screw-on filter, your eye cup, you won't believe it, will. You know, if you've got a minute's exposure, you'll find these funny little artefacts on your image. So do, once you've got it all set and you press the, you know, for your 30-second exposure. And by the way, manually pre-focus before you drop your filter in because you won't see a thing after you've dropped the filter in. So manually pre-focus or lock the focus um, and then put a little you know, small piece of black cloth over the um, uh, eye cup or if you're using a coking filter, I just got a little black strip, just wrapped it so there was no light between the filter holder and the actual lens itself. Can I ask a question? Yes, please do. I, I've converted my um, Nikon D70 to infrared about 15 years ago. And right. I converted it to 720 nanometers. Yeah. And I've just seen that when you showed us a 650, that's the effects I want, the blue and white. So can you get the blue and white filter with the 720 nanometer? Yes. What I did there was I took that red image which is what you would get with your 720 nanometer because my other camera was that and of course they're not that far apart what you do then is go into your channel mixer and basically swap red for blue yeah but i've tried that a hundred times with mine and it never never works but oh. on the 620 that's why i said can you explain it in more detail uh i've only done it really done the channel swap on my um i think it's 655 my other one was 720 uh it should do it because if you've got if when you import the image yeah. did you import the the infrared image so it's basically pinkish reddish yeah brownie color yeah yeah that's it so in that case that's the color you've got so as long as you're using the software correctly it, it, you basically you tell it swap the brownie color for a bluey color um i'm not a photo are you using photoshop i use photoshop i think i've got on one though i never used the trouble is i subscribed to photoshop when i had my own photoshop i had loads of um filters in there and i had yeah. a filter that i really liked when you subscribe it knocks all your fit or knocks all your private filters out the ones that you've imported uh. Yeah. So I'm stuck with a load of infrared images that I just don't know how to process them anymore because okay. I, well, I found a filter that I really liked. In that case, I would import it into On One. Yeah. Uh, if, well, I'll tell you what to do. If you email me, I'll see if I can do a screenshot of the channel mixer in On One and oh, hopefully okay. you'll be able to do, do the um, – that, that's – changing the ready brown to blue okay, uh, and my my, e my email address is d-a-v-e-d -E so that's dave d five six seven eight at sky.com that's really lovely thank you very much not a problem at all thank you diana do you have the email yes dave d five six seven eight at sky.com well, i'll okay. tell you what if i type it it should go to everybody Will it? <laughs> thank it. you diana Let's go, I don't see if the technology works. Hopefully you can all see that. So I hope that that was um, something different anyway. And uh, thank you, Aggie, for giving me a task to put a new talk together. So uh, it was quite interesting kind of look, looking at from, um, <coughs> from afresh and also putting in a, a range of, uh, of images. Yes, we have one more question here uh, from Keith Morris. Uh, he says, I have an Olympus EM1 Mark 11. What macro lens are you using? Ah, okay, so uh, my the one I have converted is an EM5 Mark 1, and I've, my, my main camera is now is an EM1 Mark 2. Um, for that, I use the fantastic Olympus macro lens, so that's the 60 mil f 2.8 which they reckon is one of the sharpest lenses olympus makes and uh, it's also obviously a fantastic uh, fantastic portrait lens because it works out at 120 mil uh, full frame equivalent so uh, yeah the 60 mil f 2.8 olympus macro lens is really really sharp lens and it's got uh, a little dial on the side which limits the range so you can get it so it 
it won't hunt. You can, you'll only kind of focus between very close, like a couple of centimetres and maybe half a metre. So you can actually dictate the kind of focusing limiter with a little dial on the side so it's not hunting. Okay. Any more questions from anyone? Please, now is the time. <laughs> what do any kind of thoughts on uh, seeing um, some portraits in infrared? Oh. Have you seen any before? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> that's that's for sure. Uh, what was the architecture filter you used? This is this um, multifaceted filter. So. It's a multi-image filter. Um, as I say, you can usually get them uh, a coking filter. So I think it's four or five images. Excuse me. <coughs> yes, you can pick them up very cheap. Again, I'm sure the DPS at the photography show loads of old coking filters. And um, you just drop it in and it's got a, a centre image and then you know three four or five or six images that come off like in a star and what you then do is then move when you're focusing move to what you want to be in the central bit and then you can see the all the other images spin off but uh, yeah it's it's quite it's it's real fun playing with that yes i, I have a couple of those yes. <laughs> <laughs> And as I say, don't worry about, um, I don't know how many megapixels, is, um, I forget the lady, who's, uh, Diane, um, is you really don't need a lot of megapixels. You know, infrared, uh, I think, you know, if you've got six megapixels or more, you can, you can take some stunning images. Did you ever try any other filters like uh, soft spots or, you know, no, I tend to use the, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've not done that yet. The filter I've got is a push-on type, so I can't then add another filter to it. Right. But I have played with the, say, the, particularly with the, the Olympus, the person with the uh, EM1 Mark II. And if you look at the, what is it called? Is it Dramatic Tone 2 image? And you and look at that with infrared, then the, you, you get some really heavy high contrast very interesting images so but obviously if you go the coke and filter route you can stack them up you've just got to be careful how you tape up yes. to stop the light leaks because when i first used my dslr on a tripod <clears throat> set it all up you know pre-focused drop the filter in took the photo and i've got all these little light specs and all these artifacts and i did some research and um Yes, I have to cover the eye cup up and make sure there's no light can get between the filter and the, the front of the lens or the filter. Wow. Um, well, uh, I don't know if you ever used the infrared film because uh, I have some film, but I never used it. So I don't know if I can ask you for some tips on that. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, that's something I've not shot infrared film. I think the only thing is, I don't know if it, the reprocity effect with infrared film um so i would probably have to go on youtube and do a little bit of um research but again it would be exactly the same thing aggie you you're going to be shooting um so you need a tripod um uh, in terms of the film it's normally very 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 low iso isn't it yes so you're, you're going to have long exposures so i don't know how much film you've got but what i would do for your first two or three images it's bracket uh, because on, as I mentioned in my presentation, you normally have to overexpose between one and two stops <clears throat> to get a balanced image. So, you know, when you go out, check your histogram and in your expose your compensation button uh, dial, just dial it up to about 1.3 to start off with and see how that goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, de I'll definitely have a have some you know research about how to do it i've got a few of those films but obviously yes. i don't want to waste them all on the yeah. experimenting how to do it and a very good tip for margaret of course uh, it's very very light sensitive uh, so you know yes. you've got to load and load in you know probably in um, in your changing bag ideally yeah yeah yeah. i've got the tent so i'll be yeah. that for, for it yeah thank you margaret
<laughs> so, uh, hopefully that's been uh, something different for the DPS. Thanks again for letting me um, talk. Hopefully a few of the images were all right. And um, I've seen one that I would love to have on that wall here. <laughs> here we go. Which, which, which one was it? Which and, one was uh, it? The stems of the flower, you know, it's... Oh, with the stamen just coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so delicate and uh, yeah. I just loved it. Yeah. Yes, it's it's interesting. <laughs> how, uh, you know, you normally, again, wouldn't associate ex extreme macro work with infrared, but why not? There's no rule saying you can't. So. It's beautiful. It's yeah. absolutely Thank you. beautiful. I loved it. It, it, rem it, rem it reminded me a little bit of John Blakemore's style. Ah, oh, right. Very, very, very delicate light colours and everything, the shadows. Well, I hope to see his exhibition at the Argentia Gallery in Birmingham. I've been already, I recommend it, yes. Oh, good. <laughs> it's really, really interesting. Oh, well, somebody said, best one of the domes with the cross in the air. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> right, that was, I saw that, and I thought, you know, sending to God and very, uh, yeah, could read a lot into it, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, hope, I hope there's been a, a variety there for people anyway. Of course, yes. Yeah, and if I've just helped Diane or any, anybody else stimulated just to go out and try it, uh, then uh, I think that's the thing as photographers. We should always keep trying something new, always pushing the boundaries, and um, that um, keeps us happy. Yeah. I'm expecting uh, for the next annual exhibition some infrared images. <laughs> yeah. Thank if you need a judge, I'll come along and judge them for you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. For, for no, no, no problem at all. And I say people have got my email address. So, um, anyway, uh, I hope you've found it uh, a bit different. Thank you. All Thank right. You Thank you. Much. I hope everybody has a good evening and the rest of the weekend. And you too. And thank you everyone for joining us as well. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any questions to Dave, the, there was the email in the chat. And if you have any questions about webinars, upcoming or anything like that, email me on program at the dps.co.uk. And yeah, that's that. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.